Ooh, and thank you for tuning in to this CodeBuddies.org live coding event. CodeBuddies is a global community of amazing people who help each other become better at software development through conversations on Slack and peer-to-peer -peer organized study groups and virtual hangouts. Today, we're going to continue working on the Western Friend website. Western Friend is the official publication of Quakers in Pacific, North Pacific, and Intermountain yearly meetings. That's mainly in the Western United States and Northern Mexico, which is a big group of Quakers who have been gathering around that region for uh, many, many years now. Western Friend is a, a bi-monthly publication since around, oh, well, I'm not sure the exact dates. On the website, we have uh, issues going back to, I think, 2013. And in the Deep Archive, it was uh, known uh, prior to Western Friend, the name of the publication was Friends Bulletin. And when we view the Deep Archive, that goes back to 1929. We're porting this westernfriend.org website over from Drupal, you can see down here, the footer, to the Wagtail CMS, which is built on Django, which is built on Python. <laughs> so it's a good pedigree. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, Wagtail is, is excellent. Uh, it's a WordPress, um, it, I think WordPress equivalent. It's very close in the usability, um, for the end user at least, uh, to what WordPress is. Now for the developer, it's I think a little bit nicer than WordPress. I don't know, I haven't done a lot of WordPress development, but uh, I said that from two uh, vantage points. One as like, a site developer who's just installing modules and things like that, or plugins as WordPress calls them. Um, well, the Python ecosystem is um, pretty much open source. Everything there's open source. There's not a lot of uh, really commercial commercialization in there. But the WordPress ecosystem there is, is hyper commercialized. Everything has a pro version. Um, so you'll get freemium plugin or freemium template and then you'll get nagged to upgrade to the pro version you know, it'll be features missing and um, I left WordPress development mainly because the plugin and theme ecosystem is just a mess you get a lot of duplication uh, things plugins doing somewhat similar things but having not non overlapping feature sets varying degrees of uh, support different support channels different forums you have to register with um, you don't get like the gestalt of things building on one another uh, where you get to reach higher uh, levels that you do in an open ecosystem where things are not hyper commercialized, fragmented through that commercialization. So anyway, <laughs> long way of saying uh, we've gone through the Django ecosystem, which doesn't suffer from commercialization, hyper commercialization at least. There are, you know, nothing wrong with having a commercial entity uh, running part of the community um, as long as it's not a major conflict of interest as long as, long as they're not excluding uh, features uh, due to commercial uh, strategies um, you know it's good that developers can get paid and make money and things like that but the actual the open source code needs to stay open source from my perspective and there's a lot of um, likewise a lot of Python developers who are getting paid to develop Python or doing things out of their own passion. And um, the ethos there is to build on that. You can take a package like Pandas for, for data manipulation and you get a lot of packages that are augmenting that, adding visualization and stuff like that. So um, Drupal was a, a move up in this in terms of uh, having a, a more cohesive developer experience, the Drupal module ecosystem, but it's also, it's a PHP based application. And I'm primarily doing Python development. So more or less, this is why we landed on Wagtail. It's WordPress-like experience, but with Python and Django uh, underneath it. So they've got batteries included and very good developer experience. And the core developers have been very helpful. Um, and I think some of the other community contributors have been very helpful all along the way, just of this project we're working on here for the Western Friend Magazine. Now the feature we're working on today is this deep archive, where essentially, um, all of our content is hosted on the Internet Archive, which is really an amazing project also. If you have any uh, time to go check it out, uh, or if you, you've already 
you probably have already seen, uh, for example, the Wayback Machine. So you're probably already aware of it, but uh, the Wayback Machine is just the tip of the iceberg, even though it's a very large project. I don't know on scale, proportionally, how much uh, volume of storage Wayback Machine takes compared to uh, the other types of media they're hosting, but they do have a lot of video and audio, even a computer software archive and Project Gutenberg, a lot of texts. And the cool thing about this is you can actually host your own um, photographs or texts or home videos, anything on the, on the Internet Archive free of charge. And it's non-commercial again. Uh, it is a 501c3 nonprofit, so they do ask for donations, but it's not mandatory. You just sign up for free and you can upload things uh, to the community video, for example. So it's pretty rad. Um, we're glad to be in good company. And they actually, have not only are they hosting the French bulletin issues going back to 1929, but they took the whole um, collection in several boxes and they digitized them for free. Uh, they scan them with digital cameras and run optical character recognition on the texts. So you can do full text search. Let's see if we can look for a word in here for like peace. So it's now scanning through this PDF. And it's going to show us every time the word peace occurs in the PDF and highlight the place on the page where it occurred. It gives us this page turner interface. I mean, it's just really cool stuff. Even when you have different font faces, it's able to, with some degree of success, uh, detect the texts. So you can see Quakers have quite a peace testimony. There's a lot of um, discussion that might be the topic of this issue, I'm not sure. Hmm. Very cool. So the way that looks in our context, I have to go to Magazine Deep Archive. And we're going to replicate the archive page here. We're going to display the Deep Archive issues with a little bit of a, I guess we're actually embedding the iframe here for each of the issues. And then we'll have a faceted search along the side, and that's where I'm picking up today. I'm continuing that. So the way we're developing in Wagtail is we have a page, an index page, that you can edit and change the title and text. And I just was demoing the text that you, it's a little bit of a rich text interface. Now where we left off though is actually getting the page context. Uh, this is for the magazine index page, but if I come down here to the deep archive index page, we have just a plain context, which is not really doing anything. Now the context is what gets rendered into the HTML template. It's the data that populates the page. In, order, in other words, oh yeah, I have to actually, there we go. For we view it, so the only data that's available right down to the page template is the page title and text, and you can see that if I close down a couple of other things here that we're not using right now. Here's a deep archive index page. So uh, it's really it's just a sort of, it's HTML based templating language, and you have blocks that you can override. And so here in the body or the content block, we're just showing the page title and a header and page intro and passing it through a rich text filter. Hey, what's up, Dr. Unafraid? How are you doing? Welcome to the stream. Haven't seen you in a while. Have you been doing your own streams lately? We're working on any cool projects? I think, what were you looking at? Uh, oh, I'm trying to remember, you were looking at Django development, and is that how you found this stream? Or So I have a poor memory, you'll have to excuse me if I'm if I'm wrong there. So let's go ahead and see. Uh, for So if you are interested in Django development, uh, this Git context is a parallel, at least, uh, of how Django renders page context. I think you'll find this in other frameworks as well. But essentially, you, you have this string template, which is like HTML or some kind of dialect of other uh, string uh, markup languages. Um, and you want to put some data into that so the data is called the context. Everything you see in these curly braces is the context. Dr. Interface says, good, doing pretty good, how are you? 
Yeah, I'm working on a project. Cool. Yeah, I've been pretty good. Having a relaxing new year. Got to hang out uh, with my son today and went and did some exercises and just got some chai tea here. Some herbal chai tea. Try to get some better sleep tonight. I was up to like four last night. Just couldn't sleep. Uh, Dr. Nurpay says, not in Django, but doing video editing. Next week, starting a job in Python, so part-time doing video editing. Ah, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so I, I do remember there was like a link to the Python or Django. Hmm, very cool. Are you, so what are you using for your video editing? What kind of video editing project is it? Now, are you also interested in open source video editors, by the way? Because there's actually some projects, uh, some open source video editors, one of which is built in Python. If you're interested in those, I can send the link in chat. It's a good way to learn by hacking on an actual project. <laughs> and you can get help from the core developers. Cool. So in this uh, page context, we are going to, <coughs> pardon me, uh, I'll just explain this as I go along. The way our content is organized is using Wagtail page models. And Wagtail page is a custom, it's a specific thing to Wagtail. It's, a hierarchical uh, way to organize content and you can see it in action here a little bit we have our home page which is our welcome then if I click this arrow it actually kind of drills into that layer and we have two child pages of home we have community and a magazine if I go to the magazine we go a little bit deeper I can put pages there and here's the deep archive one link deeper we actually have a deep archive article uh, sorry issue magazine issue so you can see we're kind of going down in this tree now, from uh, any of the nodes in the tree, you can get the child nodes, you can get the sibling nodes. This is the thing, how the wagtail works. So if I say self, um, what I'm gonna do is just, uh, I'll have to do some print debugging, so pardon my sort of no novice approach here. I can't get the uh, debugger to work properly. There's, it's thrown an error that I, I submitted a bug re Port and wagtail. Um, so, yeah. I can't even actually get into the Python shell last time because I had an unrelated error. Uh, it's just a little bit of a frustrating session, but so we're going to do print debugging. Print debugging. What we're going to print is um, so children equals self, which refers to the current instance. Get children. Or descendant. Get children count. Oh. That's actually a little bit better than I'll print. Get children count. So we're not going to do anything with it, but get context, context um, sort of runs, executes right before the page is sent back to the client. It's preparing the data. Uh, before the actually rendering the template, which it renders the template on server side, uh, just a quick jab at the JavaScript ecosystem. They've gone kind of full circle with through the SPA lifecycle to now they're back on server side rendering, where you know Drupal's and Django and things they've been doing server side all along, uh, and rather than just augment that with a, server, a single page application like experience, the JavaScript ecosystem uh, SPA mentality has sort of threw the whole baby out with bathwater. Uh, and now has to have, they have to redefine their own development frameworks and nothing is on the level of maturity uh, that you see from, from Django. It's, it's poor. Poor experience there. So Dr. Murphy said, yeah, freelancing work with one company, uh, getting paid per video. Uh, so do you actually uh, film, uh, do you do filming or do you do video editing? How's the, how's the work going there? All right, so then what we can do now, when I refresh this deep, ar uh, deep archive page, so I thought I had, was viewing it live, but apparently not. So let's view it live. We'll close down one of these tabs. Now you notice here it fired that little function. I should have made it more um, obvious, but uh, so the page request came here, it prepared the data, and then got the re. Well, anyway, it's kind of funny. 
that the fires before the response was logged, before the request was logged. Hmm. I don't know, whatever. But you see we have one child page, which is correct. Uh, back here on the editing interface, if we go to the deep archive, hmm, how do I just view it in context? I have to, have to click a couple times, it looks like. And now I just want to view it. Well, more or less, there's one child of the deep archive. So this is correct. I can get the children there. Hmm. So essentially, we'll get children and then we will say, now this context is a dictionary we can add to. In fact, I could just say, be a little bit less verbose, my friend Conrad will and Marcus, my friends Marcus and Conrad would appreciate that I'm doing less steps. My code is a little bit less verbose. Context, uh, archive issues. Self get children. All right, there we go. Dr. Interface says, uh, only video editing, Adobe Premiere and Filmora. Hmm, I haven't heard of Filmora. I've heard a little bit about Premiere. It's a pretty exciting project. All right, so now if we refresh, nothing's gonna happen um, because I've removed the print. So what we need to do now is iterate all over those. The whole point of that was to get them into the page context and do something with them in templates. For, uh, let's see, for issue and archive issues. I hope I said that right. And then, and then we'll end the folder. And what we'll do is just use the screen representation of the issue, which mm, should just be the title. Now we'll refresh, and there we go. We've got an, an issue coming in there. And let me just get a little bit more tea. Should be ready. Fresh, fresh brood. So the first step here is just, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, get all the issues in here. We're gonna add two layers here. We're gonna add pagination and we're gonna add filtering. I think I'll start with pagination because it's a little cleaner. Uh, yeah, and then the filtering, I, I was, uh, I did work it out a little bit. It's filtering by year, and we have a date field, and you can use the year component to filter them. Dr. Unafraid says, do you have any project in video editing? It will be very helpful. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure. Do you do motion graphics? Can you do animations with uh, Adobe Premiere? That's something I've never been able to get uh, an open source motion graphics editor. Oh, I think it's After Effects you need for uh, motion graphics. Hmm, darn. I don't have any video footage um, that needs to be edited. We are wanting to do a promotional video for this other open source project we have. Um, but I think it's like a whole production would be needed, like mm, voiceovers, perhaps motion graphics, at least screenshots of the of that tool in use, and then like you know people using it or how their lives are changed by it, stuff like that. So we would need to write a script, have it recorded, do the video editing, find the right pictures and media. Sorry, is my camera wiggling? Nope, not too bad. Okay. Dr. Underfrit says, I can do animation, but not good in motion graphics. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really good in those either. I've tried Blender 3D. But before Blender 2.8, the learning curve was just crazy. And even with Blender 2.8, uh, still, I don't have time to invest in learning Blender. 
Unfortunately, it's a pretty cool one, but I have to pick my battles. All right, so. Okay, so what we're doing here is actually just getting the um, the static image. If I inspect the code here into Drupal site, you can see that each of these, can you see that there's my mount, there's my video over that. Okay, I just have to keep that in mind that the video's on that thing. So for each of these, displaying it in a row and we have a link to the item on the Western Friend website and then an extra div and then an image and what this image is doing is getting it's linking to the page also so you can just click right on the image I think I probably don't need both of those Titles there, and here's the little bit of a trick we're doing: archive, um, and just adding the identifier here. Internet Archive has pretty consistent URL conventions with how things are organized. So maybe I'll just take this, Where's that? and then the caption has the title. So I'll take the whole thing. I'll clean up the code. Caption. Yeah, a little bit of copying and pasting, but what we're gonna do is try to come close to that, but in a more um, clean way. This is not the most elegant. We might be able to do a grid here. I don't know if that's a good idea, though. Dr. Runner Pitt says, are you working on a freelancing project? Yeah, this uh, Western Friend is more or less freelancing. You could call it that. Uh, I've been doing it for about mm, six years now, working on this project, the Western Friend website, as well as uh, doing a little bit of other technology um, research and maintenance, like we're using Nextcloud for our communications and uh, document storage, so I helped with that. And Nextcloud is really nice, also if you have a, if you need like file storage, real time editing like Google Docs, um, online meetings like mm, Skype or whatever, um, calendar. It's got a lot of features. It's really cool. All right, so for each of these, let me just save and see if they'll lint up for me. All right, good. Um, what we're gonna do is the href should be generated by Wagtail for us. So I can just say page. There's a Wagtail helper that'll do this for us. It'll generate the page URL. Come on, close that. Four, and I've got my Wagtail core tags here, so that should already be in the context for the issue. So that's the first thing, page URL for the issue. Uh, actually, I think I have to use this. Oops. Percentage. And uh, I have a couple of other open source projects that are brewing right now. Um, we've been doing this music app. Uh, it's an interactive music composition interface. Uh, we haven't got to the composition part. We've just been making sounds with it, but it's been pretty cool. So the image should be, okay. So now the cool thing is the issue actually has the I, in archive identifier here. If I look at the magazine, a uh, deep archive, the archive issue, here it is, Internet Archive Identifier. We'll take this field and make a string out of it. And I think we've had some problems with this before. Let me just try it. I should be able to do double brackets. And then I say issue, uh, Internet Archive Identifier.
And I'm just going to take the caption off for now. Just a little bit of extra stuff. Let's just see if this works. OK, well, we have something. The link is working. The image is not. Let's see what the problem is. I think it's something to do with this being in quotes. Doesn't work. Or that my property is wrong. Sometimes that's the problem. I don't see why that would be the problem. Let's go ahead and take a look. So we have the issue display here, then another line, hopefully showing its uh, identifier here. Yeah, it should work. Uh, then the image, which maybe I'll just comment over now. All right. So definitely not working. Let's see, Dr. Unafraid says, uh, music app or what? Actually, I have a question. Can we create Android's apps with Python and Django? Okay, so first question, um, music app. Uh, the music app is a web app. It's just JavaScript right now, SVG, JavaScript. Um, well, an HTML to render it in the browser, but even, yeah, you need HTML to bind the, the scripting language. Uh, can you create Android apps with Python, Django? Well, definitely with Python. You can create, Android apps with, for example, Kiwi, cross-platform Python framework for NUI development. I don't know what NUI is, but <clears throat> it will r run on Linux, Windows, OS X, Android, iOS, and Raspberry Pi from one code base. They've got a lot of demo apps, so I'll send this link in chat. Uh, Django is a web application or like a server uh, framework for web applications. So it's not really going to hit the sweet spot of running, of developing mobile apps. It's not meant, it's not designed for that. The closest I can think is that Django applications have been um, uh, developed, like, what's it so called? OmniDB, for example, which I use sometimes in my day to day work is a Django application that has been <laughs> wrapped up in, um, I'm not sure exactly how they bundle it, but I think it's it's got like Chrome browser. So what is that called? Uh, it's like a, it's a self-running server and then it runs the browser and the UI. I'll think of it in a little bit. Uh, it was developed by GitHub. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see it's just, it's a Django app, Python 3.5, with a bunch of JavaScript stuff. And then I think they bundle it all together using, almost had it, forget. Uh, Electron or something like that. Meteor uses Electron. There's also this, um, Node WebKit and Proton Native, but in any case, Django is not going to hit the sweet spot there. Back to the Python question, though, I highly recommend checking out either Kiwi or Qt. Uh, Qt is an excellent framework. Now, it's a cross-platform software development framework. Uh, you can write Qt apps with several different um, languages: C++, uh, JavaScript. And then they have this, they have a couple of them, but Qt for Python is the latest um, official Python bindings. So you can start here. And then there's PyQt, which was made by another company, uh, Riverbank Computing. And basically, the main thing is, um, Because Qt is a cross-platform framework, in other words, it targets many desktop apps as well as being able to build uh, your code on Android and iOS. Um, 
and even run cute apps in the browser now with uh, cute for uh, WebAssembly or whatever the target is, the build target. Uh, it's a really good framework. And on the level of maturity, it's been around for a long time. It's got a lot of batteries included, so you'll have a similar development experience to what you would with Django or some other mature development framework. It's got a pretty broad community, and there's a lot of open source projects being built. Cute. So yeah, I would say, yeah, check out Kiwi or Cute for doing apps with Python. Native mobile apps. Yeah, I think it's native. I think it compiles to native. What kind of app are you wanting to build? That might be that also might inform the question. If you have an idea of some of the features you'd like to support, uh, whether or not it needs to be native might um, be useful to know. Or if you are going to be using web-oriented um, views, or if you'd like it to be able to run in a web browser as well as being a native app, those would be some things that you could uh, explore. Yeah. Once you have a project idea, then you could choose the tools based on the projected uses of that tool, um, project. All right, so why, what's going on here with my field? So either, maybe I just, okay, if we have an archive issue, it should have an internet archive identifier, so that's the first thing to check. Um, if I just click it and go visit it and edit it. Uh, I think that is the problem here. Wait, wait, wait. Here we go. Okay, so I can close this now. We do have an internet archive identifier because that's how this is rendering. So this could be that. <coughs> this weird gotcha. Sometimes you have to, if you have a field that's defined on a child model of a, that inherits from page, you have to actually ask for the specific URL that way. There we go. So yeah, that was the gotcha, now it's working. Very cool. All right, so I think this is good. This is a good start. Now, what we have here is the more or less the title. I'll refresh it real quick, uh, which is very generic. After some decade, they just started keeping these really generic titles, unfortunately. And they're almost not useful. It just takes up a lot of space on the screen. Let's see, Dr. Unafraid says, I'm not sure what type of app I would develop, but it might be a Gmail type. Hmm. To like, like a webmail app or, so you can check your, your email from Android or whatever, is that what you mean? Or check Gmail from Android. Because there's another, actually just bears mentioning, there's Flutter, if you're not, if you don't mind not using Python, uh, these Flutter apps gives you a pretty rapid development cycle. The paradigm here is called declarative UI. It's basically the way you, you define uh, user interfaces with, all it, with um, HTML is declarative, you say, this is our, our widget hierarchy or our, uh, they're in HTML called uh, elements, our element tree. And um, with Flutter, you have also a declarative way of defining your user interface. The code is, the language is Dart. So it's not even that common of a language, but it's not all that hard to learn, I suppose. I haven't worked with it directly. What you get from it though is very rapid, uh, elegant UI development uh, using material design and a pretty fast growing community, but it's really Google oriented. Uh, Google is um, responsible for this project. So caveat emptor, 
um, they will have unilateral control of how the code base evolves. But that way you can also just If you're wanting to do an app, the first thing you should do is um, check for other apps that are doing it, right? What, what's your competition? Then, particularly in the open source ecosystem, try not to just fragment the place further and develop, even if you know you want to learn, and, and developing is a good way to learn, so I shouldn't you know, temper your eagerness to learn. I'm not trying to do that here. Uh, really, if you want to develop your own app, that's cool. But I think I just tend to see this pattern of like, um, library and app proliferation where, and particularly in open source video editing, it's honestly, there's like six or seven open source video, video editors that are just, they're all like half-baked to a certain extent. And if they would just unify and work on the same dang project, or at least two main projects, uh, I think we would be a lot further down the road in the open source uh, video editing firm, uh, field. Um, now, video editing is a lot more complicated than, the, than webmail, but there are some good open source uh, webmail clients for Android that you might actually just be able to come in and uh, con you know, do some light contributions, find a low hanging fruit like a bug or something like that, get some mentorship from the core developer. Um, like this K9 one, let me see if this is written in Python. I use this on my Android. Mm, contribute. Let's hop over to GitHub. Yep. It looks like it's written in Java, which is going to be pretty common in um, Android, to be honest. But uh, or Kotlin, a little bit of Kotlin now too. So that's also something to consider. If you're targeting Android, then the predominant language is Java and Kotlin now. I think Kotlin's taking over. But if you want to be cross-platform, then you have some good options. And Java, you know, the promise of Java was that you could write cross-platform apps, uh, desktop apps primarily. But now we're actually writing more or less mobile targeted apps. Another cool thing with webmail apps, um, yeah, Java's not my cup of tea here, right? <laughs> Mine either. Uh, you might actually then take note from um, Electron, because one of the promises, uh, or the, I believe I'm, I'm not mistaken here, Electron or what's the other one? Cordova, actually, Cordova. If you could do JavaScript, Apache Cordova might be your friend. Now you just write web standard HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you can target Android, iOS, I believe is what they're meaning here, and then uh, I think this is Windows phones. But it's you know it's primarily JavaScript, so. And you know, naturally, webmail client would be pretty, you know, close uh, relative to web standards. And it'll even get you, you know, certain features. OSX is well, they have those things, but uh, you know, you can check phone features and learn how to access device location and save media and stuff like that. That might be useful in other projects you end up developing. And, you know, Cordova being an Apache project also is a good sign from my perspective because the Apache Software Foundation is a really good um, community organization. Uh, they have uh, good governance policies. They help to make sure that projects are sustainable, things like that. So. You know, they'll tell you if the project's active or it's been dormant, where you can file bugs. Now, this is weird. Cordova doesn't seem to have had a recent release. 6.3.1, is that true? And naturally, you'll have people in the JavaScript ecosystem screaming 
about this project being so old and antiquated. So you have to move on to something new and shiny. Uh, from the official release nine months ago. So yeah, nine, version nine, somehow the Apache page just hasn't been updated. Um, you know, it's, let's see, what is this? It was really popular. I guess this is all just within one year. Hmm, anyway. Never worked on Apache. Yeah, I haven't actually worked on the Apache server or anything like that. They have a lot of projects, though. A lot of really cool projects. All right, so now our page is rendering. Let's just spruce it up just a little bit. Um, I guess the... Um, I'm trying to think if I should use a grid first. Because the um, cover images are just narrow. I think, you think with Bootstrap you can just naturally get a card grid just by specifying. So if I put in a card and then just say this is um, three columns wide, I think it will actually naturally wrap it for me. See if this will work and how bad it looks. <laughs> All right, so it's doing a full width uh, card. Interesting. Let's just try three of those. Same issue to see how they look. And we're also not getting the. Do a card. All right, I'm just playing top. So yeah, let's look for a little recipe for having a bootstrap card grid. I want to display multiple cards, but I don't want to be too explicit about the number of rows or anything. I want to define rows. I don't really know. I guess I could. Yeah, I just don't know. There should be a way of letting the browser figure it out. Mm, we have to do rows there. Take a look how I did this in the magazine section. Magazine index page. Magazine issue card. All right. Yeah, they just have, I'm just defining columns here, card. Let's go ahead and bring this in. And it looks like in my magazine index page, it just has a row containing all of them, which makes sense. You do have to have a row. So the row would be here. Then iterate over the things and do this. Just paste that in there so I have it. Put my for loop inside of that row. Now Small four, so here I am just telling it how many columns wide. I'll just grab that margin bottom also. Ah, so you have to wrap the column around the card. 
starts to get divitis. goes in there. All right, so with the href. I think most of that's pretty standard. All right, so I'm, I got div there. Div there, an extra div. So we've got one too many divs. And this needs to go inside of there. There we go. Looking good. So there's one. Inside the card. I think it'd be the card body. Oops, where did I put it? I must have deleted it by accident. So card. And this needs to have the close quote. That's why that's not appearing correctly. This looks like a magazine issue, and then you've got the title. I wonder if I could wrap this whole thing, the whole card in href. I think that looks funny. Let's just see how it. tag. That way you can click anywhere on there. Ooh, well, I'll let Mary tell me if that looks bad. What's looking good, uh, Dr. Unafraid, the uh, patch cordova project? Sorry, I missed the context. Or is this card looking good? <laughs> In which case, thank you. And thanks Bootstrap for providing ready-made CSS and sort of almost web components. Excellent. Maybe I'll just put a little bit of a tweak that. Okay, cool. Cards looking good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, what do you think about this hover, the underline on the hover? Is that okay? <laughs> I mean, for some reason I don't like it, but maybe it's not even that big of a deal. But what I do want to see is if we can actually, how three or four or six cards would look. One, so that's just that one. Right, so yeah, we get good, good layout. And there's spacing between them all. Now the challenging part, pagination. It's gonna be fun. I have some code that works for it. And perhaps that's where I'll stop today is get pagination working uh, with this card layout and then come back refreshed tomorrow and finish out this faceted search by the year. You can filter in, you can filter the issues by the year they were published. Got my 
Puka chai, puka, I guess is how you say it, and yogi tea mix. This life is a gift. May this day be the day to lead us to peace, to happiness, and to joy. I'll drink to that. And Happy New Year's, by the way. Happy 2020. We'll go back to one because this is that's good enough markup. Uh, Dr. Runafraid says, what's the duration of this project? Well, good question. <clears throat> we estimated it would be done in six months last year. October 14th started the project. <laughs> and here we are today. Uh, 90% done, 90% done with the minimum viable feature set. Then we need to do this whole review. We're gonna go over the whole project with, with Mary and uh, find all the rough spots and uh, make a list of those. So that, so I should say we're probably 80%, close to 80% done. And that last 20% is probably gonna be the most, well, I don't know if it'll be the most work. I hope that these 80% of these features the, uh, are like the backbone of the project. And then the last 20% will be just cleaning up the edges, putting a coat of paint on it. And really, I'd like to, we're trying to have this thing published uh, within the next month. So I'm kind of, in the last couple of weeks, especially I've been, over the holiday break at least, I've been trying to really um, finish off these last few features. Yeah. Oh, darn, I didn't even re remember uh, this task. So actually, I'm doing a whole different thing. I'm over here. Doing this feature. All right, let's take a look at the pagination. We'll commit these changes because it's looking good, looking good. We've got the deep archive issues in there. Unfortunately, pagination is one of those batteries that Django comes with. It makes it uh, somewhat straightforward. And there's a really great blog who, um, blogger named, uh, writing the blog, Simple is Better Than Complex. I was trying to think of the guy's name. Vitor Freitas. Freitas. Not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. He actually lived in Helsinki. He's from, he lived in Finland where I am living also. Uh, from Brazil, though I've never met Vic, Vitor, uh, I have definitely referred to his work, and he, he's got some great tutorials on here. And I kind of borrowed from it for the pagination, so let's take a look at how we're handling pagination in this pagination approach can be found in the memorials. That's a good start. I was working on that recently. So you go to the model and it's the same place you're, when you're preparing the page context, you've got an index page that's gonna display all of them. And then we're gonna grab them all. And this is for faceted searching. Here's the pagination code. <clears throat> I will copy and paste this. That comment is out of it. Come on, just get off the thing. The comment is getting out of sync from the 
code as pin staffing. How about that? 10 items. A little less to get out of sync as I copy and paste across apps, uh, but then if I change this variable, the comment would need to be updated. Um, another, uh, actually, a better way of doing this is an explanatory variable, and then the code is self documenting. where it's being used. Oh, come on. So then we'll just bring all this in. A little bit updated. Cool. So did you uh, did you celebrate New Year's, Dr. Unafraid? Do you use the Gregorian calendar also? Uh, I'm not sure, I just don't wanna to be too <laughs> presumptive. I think there's also different uh, calendars and, and different ways of celebrating our circuit around the sun or how the moon circles, earth, etc. I'm trying not to too presumptive. Uh, I don't know if this is interesting, but um, it was just a reminder on Hacker News, uh, this VS Code IDE that I'm using um, around Christmas time changed for the developer version, so like the preview version that only uh, the majority of users should be using non-developer version, but if you want the latest features before they're officially released, then you can use this developer version. They changed the little icon on your menu there to have a Christmas hat. I think it was like a maybe it was a Christmas tree or a Christmas hat, one of the two. Uh, and um, well, somebody sort of took offense, like cultural offense, to that uh, because well, Christmas. It has a fraught history, apparently, that as I've grown a little bit to know more than you kind of see that it's sort of a little bit of a, well, sort of a way of telling some cultures that they're irrelevant, in other words, that their traditions are no longer relevant and that even their whole faith is no longer relevant because now we have this new faith which supersedes your faith. Uh, and brings us out of the era of your faith. So I didn't realize that how packed a little icon could be with like sort of emotion and uh, history. And so something as simple as seemingly uh, nefarious? No, 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 seemingly, uh, anyway, not my last words, but it turned into, a, but they handled it very quickly. It turned into a little bit of an issue, but there was a GitHub issue opened and the VS Code developers just handled it right away. They said, all right, we're removing the icon. Sorry, didn't mean to offend you. So I think that was a good way to respond to that. Just some of the um, responses on the Hacker News discussion, what not, they were a little bit more vitriolic. They were just like saying, oh, now it's just whoever is the most offended is uh, going to rule the world or something like that. I don't know. I don't think that was called for. And I think we, have, we do need to mind, be mindful of when dominant cultures are suppressing or repressing uh, or marginalizing people and that marginalized groups actually should have a broader voice and in some ways more relevancy uh, should be uh, more attention should be paid to their needs in a way that the might make the dominant group a little bit un uncomfortable uh, as we navigate this but uh, anyway a little bit of an aside we now, as we navigate this international multicultural reality we live in, Dr. Unafraid says, why do you choose Python, sir? In India, there are too many calendars. And then, yes, I heard that, but didn't see it, the, the logo. You heard about that, the Christmas logo. So I'll, yeah, I'll go with the first one, the, or the question you asked is, why do I choose Python? Mainly, it's a language that's focused on human uh, expression and that while English is a predominant language, uh, and that has a whole colonial and imperialist past, I, I'm, and I'm sure you're fully aware of that in living in India, uh, how some of the reasons why English has come to be 
the international auxiliary language. Um, that aside, I think a lot of languages, programming languages, are oriented towards English, but in, uh, Python language seems to put more of like a human aesthetic to the language, like. By way of example, well, then Python is actually a uh, false victim to this also. The idea of zero-based indexing, where when you have a list of things and you want to get the first item in the list, you have to use the zeroth list index. Um, that is a remnant or a relic or sort of a result of the way computers internally uh, represent things. And it's basically an implementation detail. But when humans express, give me the first item on the in line, or the first customer in line come forward, or the give me the you turn to the first page in your book, uh, we don't we start counting at one, right? We don't start counting at zero. So uh, I think it's important that these uh, computer languages they take um, human um, perspective into mind because when you're designing the language. Because at the end of the day, a, pi a programming language is a human language. It's designed for humans to interact with computers and to give computers instructions. Yeah. So that's why I've gone with Python. And I think they've done an overall really good job of making things, um, you know, human friendly. It's got a good spirit, and also the ethos in the community, the Python community, is to build things up and keep uh, getting to higher levels of abstraction and capability, and not throw things away, not to just leave a littered path of broken projects and abandoned projects in your wake. Uh, so those are some of the reasons. I've really been enjoying using some Python libraries like Pandas and Django, Wagtail, stuff like that. What, what makes you interested in um, Python in particular, but in general with the languages you choose and the technologies you choose, do you have any heuristics that would help, that help guide your decisions when you're you know, developing a new project, for example? Choosing your technologies for that. Okay, so we got some copy pasted code. Did I learn Python in college or my own self? Well, interestingly, I, I learned it uh, mainly by myself and at work. And I started like, oh, well, 12 years ago or so, I was sort of uh, working a day job at a Chinese delivery, a food delivery driver, as a Chinese food delivery driver in Kansas. <laughs> and, uh, the owners there were really nice, and they actually just let me, during downtime between orders, they let me just kind of sit and read a book. So I bought this book called Python for Dummies, because I'd heard about the Python language. This was 2006, 2005, 2006. And then um, I thought it was kind of interesting that it was named after Monty Python. And uh, read through the book and didn't really absorb most of the knowledge, but it was interesting. and it. It's uh, human friendly enough, designed human friendly enough that it can be read, you know, as a book. And I think the Python for Dummies book even had jokes in there and stuff and pictures and yeah. So anyway, that was my first exposure to Python. Uh, then about 10 years later, I or eight years later or so, uh, started doing web development. And then when I started developing software by doing, uh, that's when I learned the most. Um, I learned more JavaScript oriented development approach using another very human oriented uh, development framework uh, initially called Meteor.js. It was initially designed to make it very quick to prototype an app and to take away some of the cognitive burden that developers go through, cognitive and just time burden that you go through, like scaffolding an app, choosing a framework, you know, selecting build tools and all that kind of junk that really we shouldn't be having to subject ourselves to that level of uh, machine um, stewardship, I guess. It's like you have like this machine that has needs as well and you have to build, I don't know, it's just a mess, but Meteor abstracted all that and give you a really quick way to get a, an app out the door running in production and even scaled fairly well. But then the JavaScript community kind of picked it, picked its eyeballs out. They just basically picked it apart and said, well, it's not secure enough. It's not to scale enough and then react comes around and now it's got to be more reacty or you got to have to basically write meteor apps with react front end and so now we're going to throw away a lot of the simple semantics and the ease of use that meteor initially had as its like mantra uh, it lost its path and then the javascript community went on to greener pastures um, 
Yeah, so then I turned to JavaScript, I mean, sorry, from JavaScript to Python, I said, I'm tired of this, I'm burnt out. Um, what, there's gotta be a better way to develop and maintain software in a community. And what is that? I think Python's got a pretty good ethos and pathos. So yeah, long waves. But that's what you asked is why I'm using Python and where I learned Python. <laughs> Have you been uh, studying any pro programming in college or anything like that? All right, so which file are we in here? Let me just double check. We're in the memorials file, so I can uh, close that out. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna comment, uh, commit this. I mean, to see, I cleaned it up a little bit. And now, Ah, Dr. Nerfred says, how can I start JavaScript? Now this is a um, something I should mention also. So there's this project called jQuery that is still around and, and um, John Resig uh, is the creator of um, jQuery. What jQuery did was smooth over some of these inconsistencies across browsers and give you a, some either high level of semantics for interacting with HTML pages, basically the DOM, DOM sorry, the DOM, document object model. Um, now the, way, the reason I bring this up is the way I learned JavaScript was on Khan Academy. And they have this really great course. They have a lot of really great courses. Um, as you can see, I think you can see that. Yeah, you can see that. Where are we going? Here we are. Math, math, computing, sorry, here we are. Computer programming. Right here. You know, I'm not in any way ashamed to say this. I learned to program at Khan Academy and reading a Python for Dummies book uh, while doing Chinese food delivery in between deliveries. But, okay, there you are. Um, they teach JavaScript by direct manipulation almost. Direct manipulation means you're as close to the object you're creating as possible. It's almost like you're touching it. And, in a way you do actually touch the code, you can click and drag on your code to change per, uh, parameters and move things around and animate them. Um, and it teaches you a full spectrum, like a full workflow, all the concepts you need. And this computer programming curriculum and the, um, the whole software powering this platform that gives you interactive code and, and these video tutorials that actually walk you through code, they like write the code and you see the result. All of it was created by John Resig. <laughs> so it's a long way of saying um, that these pedagogical tools and these developer tools should be really human oriented and very na natural for us to adopt in our languages that we're developing and tools in which we're developing to teach those. So here, I don't know if you can hear this. The right side is still that boring white canvas. Well, there's no ellipse yet because I need to give more information. So this is actually live code. I can pause and I can change this. And what size it should be? The line you can see now. Oops, I must have clicked the wrong button or something. Let's begin programming by making a. There we go. So you can see these properties are moving the ellipse around. And if I pause the video, can I pause it? It's a little bit buggy on the live stream. But as they're changing the values, the code is actually changing. And if I want to change one, I think I can just click, click on it. And there's this little widget that pops up and I can actually just drag it around. And very accessible, even for adults. It's designed for children, but I think adults can learn this way as well. Khan Academy is free. It's a nonprofit organization. It's free for everyone forever. Uh, you can start, you can do the lessons anonymously, but if you log in, it lets you do, uh, it gets you like badges and stuff like that. Uh, it's really good. It personalizes it to your own needs and where you are in your learning journey, which is another thing. I think learning is nonlinear and it's really hard to batch people. I don't think it's appropriate to batch people uh, through uh, a learning process. So again, this is sort of geared towards teaching kids, but um, once you can just like get over that and say, I'm still, you know, a kid, uh, 
So you can learn a lot here at Khan Academy. Yeah, you're welcome, Dr. Underford. I'm glad to share these kind of things because these are really valuable resources. All right, so now we're going to do pagination. We'll make it happen. So I can close this. I'm done with that. And I'm done with that. Just try to get myself uncluttered here. Now, did I, do I still have that code, though? If I go to the Deep Archive Index page, I hope I still have that pagination code here, but no, I don't because I pasted a link in the chat. Dang it. All right. So let's go through here. Get the memorial model and everything from items per page down to the context. And I'll just copy that in there. Paste it in here. All right, all right, all right, all right. So I'm trying to think how we will do this. So this archive issues. I'll do that here. Pass them to the paginator. This is keeping track of what page we're on. There's a, a git parameter there. So, and then we'll put this back down here. Context archive issues equals, not double equals, and then that. Next thing is archive issues page needs to go here. Oh. So basically, I'll explain this code as we're going. So, you know, we're gonna show maybe like 10 items per page. Seems reasonable. Maybe it should be, uh, so there's a little bit, it's gonna get out of sync, but uh, our column is four. And this, uh, so this card is four columns wide and we have 12 column things. So this should be nine. Which is what uh, an explanatory variable helps with. And <clears throat> probably should have done that on the other one. No. So we create a paginator of those items. So this is all of the children of the um, deep archive, which everything, it'll be pretty flat. We're not going to nest it by year or anything, although we could potentially nest it by year. But I don't think that will be useful. Hmm. And then we're going to check what page we're on. We're going to try to get the page of items from the from all of the. Paginator, so this paginator class, I'm not even sure what all it does. I guess we could take a look at it, but it's always good to have that. Go to definition type thing in the IDE. Hey, uh, Dr. Unafraid, what type of a developer uh, tools do you use? Do you use an IDE? So paginator has an object list and a number of items per page and some orphans, interesting. Hmm. Get page will return the page. Okay, so we took a peek at the paginator class. So in other words, now we're just uh, getting the memorials for the current page. If that doesn't work, then we're just gonna show page one. Now, notice that we're not using zero best indexing here. So this is where more natural expression comes in place. We get the first page, not the zeroth page. Very cool. And if the page is, uh, so if the page is not an integer, then we're gonna just make it an integer. If the page is empty, then we're just gonna give the last one. This is the recipe I got from uh, Simple is Better Than Complex, so I'm sticking with it. Finally, we're gonna pass in those paginated memorials to the archive issues. So this should now work. Um, uh, granted, I only have one. Oh, Jupyter. So Dr. Nerfraid says PyCharm for Python and VS Code for Django and Jupyter sometimes, once used Anaconda. Yeah, those are all solid projects. I did use Python, PyCharm for a while too. It was my first IDE experience. And I was like, wow, mind blown. This is cool, it's worth it to have an IDE. Then, <clears throat> somewhat fortuitously, the uh, my PyCharm license key somehow stopped messing with, 
stuff working. Because I was using the licensed version to have Django support, right? Yeah, which was pretty nice. So, but anyway, it stopped working and I didn't want to mess with it. And rather than kind of flow through or like into an issue and keep biting my head, I would let it flow around an issue sometimes. More like Taoist or like how water um, gains its power. Um, so I was like, well, what other IDEs are out there? And I said, like, well, let me try VS Code, even though I was like a little bit uh, skeptical about it, particularly that it had tele telemetry and stuff like that. Um, but I think I have the telemetry disabled, or I might not even, I don't know, to be honest. But uh, it's been a really cool experience. VS Code is very solid and great for Django, great for Python. Jupyter is really cool too. I wish I could use it. Have you tried Jupyter Lab? Have you tried that? You are you using Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Lab? Okay, so now we basically need to create a couple more of these items, at least one more item so I can test the paginator. The other thing we need is a um, the paginator widget down there to, to change the page. So actually I have to open this up here and go back to the memorials and the templates, the memorial index page has this, this widget here. And this is pretty much page specific. I could probably make this a more generic reusable thing. Like if I use generic, generic variable like paginated content. In any case, I'll have just a little bit of code duplication. That's Okay, and the style might change on this um, this usage. I do need to take a quick break. Paste this code in and see if it uh, if it's going the row or if it can go below the row. Let's see if it works. Okay, we're looking good. I'm gonna take a quick break. Doctor Underfred says they're using Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, that's a solid one. Check out Jupyter Lab though if you have it, particularly if you have the uh, Anaconda distribution. You can just install Jupyter Lab with a button click or just um, pip install Jupyter space lab. I'll send a link into the chat though. It's, it's worth checking out. I don't know if it'll be the successor to Jupyter Notebook. Probably it's I think seeing more development and it's taking a more uh, IDE like approach. I can show this on the stream real quick in that Jupyter Notebook is really notebook oriented, like you have one vertical column and that's your thing, uh, your project you're working on. And if you want to browse the file system, you have to go back to a different page. And you're only working on one notebook at a time, stuff like that. Jupyter Lab doesn't have hmm. picture, just show me the picture. Here it is. View image. There we go. So over here on the sidebar, you got some tabs to list your files or show your running kernels. Uh, it's got a command palette that you can browse just like in VS Code. You can even filter it down to relevant commands by entering a couple letters. Cell tools is so you can convert your cells to like presentations or edit the metadata. And tabs shows your open tabs here, I think. Then you have over here is like a file system browser essentially you can create new notebooks create new folders uh, upload stuff uh, through the browser rather than directly editing your file system refresh stuff if you actually actually did directly edit your file system like drop drag and dropping a file in your file browser and it's not picking up over here you can have multiple you know uh, notebooks open or it's got built-in terminal you use your operating system native terminal you can even install packages right there so you can see two consoles here. I think this is probably running on Windows. I don't know. Uh, it's got markdown editing, rendering. The This is sort of like Blender. You you can change the layout how you want. You can have multiple of these viewports uh, to do different things. You can have a terminal viewport, code editor viewport, for editing directly a Python file, uh, editing your notebook files, rendering data visualizations. And that's also like our studio in, in that sense but you configure it how you want. You can uh, just split these. I think it's pretty easy to split it. And then when you close the tab, it'll just 
collapse that area. Really cool project. And if you check the development on GitHub, if we look at like 8,000 releases, what? That's crazy. That is a very rapid release cycle, or else it's like micro releases. And it's only been around since, well, 2015, because you had a really big burst, but it's had sustained development and multiple core contributors, which is a really good sign. People who have like done, you know, hundreds of commits and stayed around for a while, or at least had spurts of activity. So it's a pretty healthy project. It's part of a num uh, I thought I have to take a quick break, but uh, let me see if I can. I'll just think of this. Um, in fact, they'd probably say it. There's this other nonprofit organization that's kind of um, stewarding these data oriented things. And I, Right on the top of my brain. Hmm. Numb something, numb focus. <laughs> Nonprofit supporting open code for better science. And so they, they support a bunch of tools and open science endeavors like developing this picture of the black hole. Um, here's the prod, let's see, where's the list of tools? And then it's not strictly um, Python oriented. It's also, you know, Jupiter itself stands for Julia, Python, R, and LaTeX. So it's a polyglot platform. Um, so Increasingly, I think we don't need to bike shed with other languages. That's one thing that I think has emerged out of the data science community of this maturity level where we can work across languages, across projects, and build things up to higher levels of abstraction, where I just didn't see since that in the uh, JavaScript web development community, and the front-end development community in particular. So it's really nice to be back in some sort of like, uh, oops, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Just a more mature uh, and evolving ecosystem. Cool, that's it. I'm gonna take a quick break and I'm gonna come back here and finish up this pagination. Dr. Nerfraid says it's used for data science. Yeah, it's used for everything. Uh, in the, you could call it under the umbrella of data science. You can see here data mining, numerical computing, statistical computing, big data, high performance, visualization, modeling, data wrangling. So yeah, you got the full spectrum there. And even lower level stuff like how do you, keep your data and code revisioned in sync. There's, um, and how do you teach people and how do you uh, encourage universities to adopt these tools? Like there's a w wide spectrum of activities that need to go into building an ecosystem. And if we can't even get past uh, sustaining one single project, you know, that ecosystem is not gonna take off. And data science people know that this is, you have to work at a sociological level and not so much in a bike shedding mode uh, constant reinvention mode. So yeah, again, I don't want to be too much off the beaten path here, but yeah, these are good questions and it's very stuff I'm pretty interested in. I think you are also cool. I'll be right back.
Thanks for sticking around. Now, with the pagination, I just need to add one more item to test the pagination will work. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's grab one from way, way back in the day. Friends Bulletin, January 1929. And I'm going to close the tab. Oh, so here I am in the deep archive on Wagtail editing interface, which is designed to be a lot like WordPress. Uh, added child page and knows it should be an archive issue because I've got my content hierarchy defined strictly. Ah, Dr. Murphy says, oh, all right, I'm leaving, sir. It's 1 a.m. All right, see you, yeah, see you tomorrow. I'll try to broadcast tomorrow, uh, probably a little earlier. 1 a.m. your time, okay. Yeah, I'll try to be a little bit earlier. All right, well, have a great day. Oh, I do have a meeting tomorrow afternoon, though. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> have a great day, and thanks for stopping in, Dr. Unafraid. All right, so we're just going to add one title here, the identifier, which I can get right down here. Western Friend volume, I'll just say 0.1. It's not quite Western Friend yet. <laughs> I'm doing zero based indexing. Uh, long logo. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know why we're using this. This is Friends Bulletin. It's not a Western Friend volume. So this, as we had to introduce a JavaScript widget so we can get dates before 1950, which of course stuff happened before 1950. So January 1st, was, uh, I don't know if, heck, I don't know when it was published. That sounds good though. And that should be good enough just to get us something to test the pagination. Now, if I get a deep archive, we should have Oh, another issue prop up, cropping up. It's not going to be a, a clean grid. It'll be a little bit irregular. Oh, well. The main thing here is if I toggle my items per page and I say one. Wood Casty, there we go. Now we refresh. It only shows one item. Very good. I'm going to put that back at nine. Now the main uh, deal here, archive issues, is not paginating, paginating properly because I'm not using the thing right here. So now we're paginator, pagination, paginator is working on page one of one. And if I put this back down to one, save, Wait for the thing to do it and then reload one of two. Ah, but the buttons aren't loading. All right, so there. We have to see why. Why, why, why? Oh, because I'm being sloppy. I'm getting kind of hungry. Oops. Oh, dang, what did I do there? Now we should have buttons. Next. Previous. Yes. All right, it's looking good though. So we'll set this back to nine, and I'm gonna call it an evening because what have we been? One and a half hours, right? Uh, that's a good amount of time. Got to hang out with Dr. Unafraid. Uh, had a few people stop in, but no, mainly lurkers, hanging out, nobody else in the chat, unfortunately. Got to get off on some interesting topics. So yes, 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 what did I do? Helper points. I don't know if you can see who's in there. We'll commit these. Review those changes. This is all pagination. And this is all pagination. Very good. Pagination. A little down the road. It's a bit of card grid with pagination, I'll just say. Well, great. Okay. Well, thanks for stopping in. Thanks for checking this out. If you're on YouTube watching this and you made it this far, I appreciate it also. <laughs>
Uh, feel free to leave me any questions or comments down below. Any of the topics discussed in this video or, or other topics relating to Python development, web development, I'll try to answer those questions promptly. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, and if it's within the re re recent time frame of publishing this. Um, and I'm not sure of other distribution channels or if the videos will be cross-posted or anything like that. Okay, again, this has been a CodeBuddies.org live coding session. There's a lot of good activity going on in CodeBuddies. If Python and Django and Wagtail aren't your thing, there's a lot of other groups, including people doing machine learning, deep learning, you know, PHP, Ruby on Rails, Java, JavaScript, uh, Swift, you name it. There's a group uh, forming around your technology of choice. The CodeBuddies.org platform is also open source and under uh, development. Currently, they're uh, rewriting it from the ground up with new features and capabilities, a fresh start. So if you'd like to get in uh, early in an open source project and start building out your portfolio or resume, this is a great opportunity, or just in general helping a, a good community. All right, well, thanks again for watching and have a great day.